Good morning. Welcome to All Saints. My name is Shelton, and I'm so happy that you're worshiping with us this morning. Those of you that are here, those of you that are watching online, special welcome to our visitors. If you want to know more about our church, uh, on our website, there's a link uh, that says contact. Or uh, if you're here, at the back of the bulletin, there's something that you can fill out and uh, put back in the uh, white box back there or, or give it to me or anyone else that you see who, who comes up here. Some announcements before we get started. You'll, you'll notice that there are a lot of things that go on during the week here. And uh, I believe it's on page 13. You can see the various events. There's ladies' Bible studies, corks and forks, and a men's Bible study as well. Also, the kids are going to be singing on Easter Sunday. So during every Sunday of March after the service, Natalie Shaw is going to be practicing with the kids. So be prepared for that. Next uh, Sunday is the beginning of that. Isn't it great that tomorrow is March? I'm so happy tomorrow is March. If you look at the beginning uh, of the bulletin, you'll find that as Christians, we are in a season right now called Lent. And Lent means that there is light that's coming, that there's been darkness, but light is coming. And I think many of us can relate to having gone through dark times and, and light is, is now on the horizon. During the season of Lent, our call to worship is our poems, that are poems of lament, songs of lament. And you notice today that several times the author of these poems are saying, I'm so afraid, I'm so afraid. But what that does is it makes me trust God even more. A lot of times in the Bible, God tells us not to be afraid, not because everything's gonna work out the way that we want them to, it always doesn't work out that way, uh, not to keep a st stiff upper lip, but don't be afraid for this reason. I'm always with you. And with that in mind, let's, have, let's stand and have our call to worship. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk, they watch my steps, and they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape. In wrath, cast down the peoples, O God. If you have kept count of my tossings and put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Let's cry out in truth to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Our affirmation of faith comes from the Heidelberg Catechism. Christian, what do you believe when you say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and everything in them, who still upholds and rules them by his eternal counsel and providence, is my God and Father because of Christ the Son. I trust God so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for body and soul and will turn to my good whatever adversary he sends upon me in this sad world. God is able to do this because he is almighty God and desires to do this because he is faithful Father. Let's pray together. Our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you, we look at these four walls and the ceiling and we, in our imagination and in truth, are in your presence. We are with those who have lived for you and died for you from the beginning of time. We are with the apostles who gave their lives to spread your gospel. We thank you and praise you that we can do this today and we know that it's happening on islands and peninsulas and continents around the world in hundreds of different languages because the stone that people rejected, the thing that they rejected, he is now the king of the universe and calling all men and women to himself. We thank you and praise you for that and we worship you for the beauty of the gospel because we pray through Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Every Sunday we have a call to confession and I want to read from Philippians here. It's on page five. At the top it says that though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We believe as Christians that God is three persons in one being. And one of the great mysteries of history is that one of these persons in the Trinity came down and lived as a human being. He separated, and not only did he come down as a human being, he came down as a carpenter in a poor place with poor parents. And not only did he come to a place that was extremely poor, he made himself a servant. He washed people's feet. He embraced lepers. And we confess our sins because God raised him from the dead, and he now rules over the whole universe. But my experience is uh, I still see him as a bellhop. I still see him as somebody that I call on when I'm in trouble, when I can't seem to make it. Rather than saying, you know what, you're the king and I'm not. And so with that in mind, if you're able and if you're willing, we're going to kneel together and confess our sins. Almighty and most merciful Father, we are thankful that your mercy is higher than the heavens, wider than our wanderings, and deeper than all our sin. Forgive our careless attitudes toward your purposes, our refusal to relieve the suffering of others, our envy of those who have more than we have, our obsession with creating a life of constant pleasure, our indifference to the treasures of heaven, our neglect of your wise and gracious law. Help us to change our way of life so that we may desire what is good, love what you love, and do what you command 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father in heaven, how true these words are. We look at somebody else's marriage and we say, I wish that my marriage was like that. We look at somebody's house and we say, I wish I had a house like that. We look at somebody's life and we say, I wish I had a life like that. And yet you have given us everything that we need to live in this world knowing you. Father, help us to remember that you are the king of the universe, that you rule all things, and you've made a promise that all things work together for good, even the things that we're embarrassed about, the things that we cringe at when we think of, why did I do that? Why did I think that? Why do I say that? Help us remember that our sins have been washed away forever because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated.
I don't have any better news than what we're about to hear. What happened when he returned to heaven after being raised from the dead? Please stand as you hear our assurance of pardon. This is the best news that we have. That's why we're here today. Therefore, God has highly exalted Jesus Christ and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Brothers and sisters, God has forgiven your sins because of Jesus, so that you might confess and praise him as your Savior and Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen. We also offer this peace to each other. Those of you that are watching online, the peace of Christ be with you. And let's turn to each other and greet each other with the peace of Christ. Well, good morning again. My name is Brad Cheney. It is uh, it's so fantastic to be able to see faces who haven't been around for months now. And yeah, we have missed you very much, and we are so glad that you're back today. Uh, those of you who are at home today and, and can't be worshiping with us with a, uh, a clear conscience, we miss you too very much. And um, our prayer is that the Lord would bring us all back together like very soon. And uh, we should have uh, like this fantastic party and celebration here, you know, hopefully at the end of, of the spring or early summer. But um, it's, it's great, truly great to see a number of you back. Acts 11, verses 19 through 30. Perhaps you've heard the story of the man who was sent to a foreign country to sell shoes. Three months later, he cable, uh, cabled back. He said... Um, I'm getting on the next boat out of here. This is the worst possible assignment. Uh, I mean, why didn't anybody tell me before you sent me out, nobody here wears shoes? Well, they, he comes back and they send his replacement. And three months later, he cables back his own message. Ship me every pair of shoes that you can possibly lay your hands on. Like, this is the greatest land of opportunity that I, I could ever have imagined. Why didn't anyone tell me before you sent me? Nobody here has shoes. Some people look out at, on America today, and what they primarily see is a culture that is headed straight to hell. Is a, many people who are... You know, full of immorality and rebellion against God, who are increasingly hostile towards 
Bible-believing values. Uh, and they're a threat because they're coming for us. Uh, so what, are they, what, do we, what does the church need to do? The church, the church must um, circle the wagons and, and denounce the evil and batten down the hatches to keep the water from coming in. But there are others who read the moment, this cultural moment, quite differently, who say, batten down the hatches, what? We, we have exactly what the world is in need of right now. No, we have the one thing that everybody needs, which hardly anyone knows anything about. We have God's grace. It's what everybody is looking for. It's grace and new life. We have new life and we have community. You know, and you know, there are so many people in this tribalized, politicized, angry world who are looking for the very things that we have. They don't even know what they're missing. And they look out on the, we look out on the world. I remember a guy saying something like this before. He said, you know, the, the fields are white unto harvest. And so what causes um, the difference between these two perspectives? What causes a Christian to feel optimistic about their ability to care for anybody who doesn't have shoes? How, how do you become a person when you look out on America today, you see a land like with a total spiritual opportunity instead of a, of a place of fearfulness and, and threat? Well, I think one of the things you can do to <laughs> make that change is just simply stop reading and watching the news and listening to the news and start reading and watching and, or listening to the Gospels, that story. But I, I'll, I'll say this very directly to you, our church. I believe you have one of the like, greatest opportunities that is, is found in America today. I mean, by virtue uh, of us buying those 13 acres, you know, six or seven miles to the west of us on Canada and Chendon, um, like those 13 acres, they really, they represent an opportunity, I think one of the greatest, maybe the greatest opportunity that has been given to a church in our denomination west of the Mississippi River, like ever. I don't know if you know anything about us and the PCA, but our churches, we don't get shots like that. We really don't. Like 13 buildable acres in the middle of the fastest growing place in like North America. <laughs> I mean, it's an incredible opportunity. I, you think about it. Um, there are a lot of different ways that we could focus on the building project, how we would do it. But I mean, you could go there, you could build, you could build a, a building that would allow you to do a good ministry there. And then later on, you could build, uh, I don't know, a really nice sanctuary that everybody thought was fantastically beautiful. But you could do other things as well. You could, you could build a missionary training center. You could build a seminary or a counseling center or soccer fields for their, your community or a basketball gymnasium or a park or a cemetery or a school for low-income students. You could do like, you could do absolutely anything. And when it, I find this really strange because when I tell my pastor friends the news, oh yeah, All Saints, we bought 13 acres out west of here. Usually their response to me, it surprises me. Their response to me is, well, that's, that's good. Good for you guys. You know, th thumbs up. And I want to pull my hair out out of that at that moment and just say do you have any idea what this means there are hundreds of thousands of people who are moving who will move there and what are people what are people doing um, when they're moving to a new place they're looking to start a new life and, and what is it what is what do they need in that new life they need the very things that a Christian church ought to be good at. They need community. They need relationships. Um, they're in the suburbs, so they need um, help raising their children. They need to keep their marriage, uh, keep it alive. 
They need to break their substance abuse addictions. They're looking to end their loneliness and boredom and just the uh, uh, lack of rootedness that's all part of modernity. And I could go on and on. But friends, like churches, churches like ours, we don't, we don't normally get that kind of shot. And what makes this even more exciting to me is that your children get to participate in this. Your children get to be like part of this project of helping other people figure out what life is really about. And as they are even participating in the project, they themselves will be discovering what life is really about. You know, um, I promise you, friends, I promise you, Jesus does not want you to raise your children in, with a fortress mentality. He doesn't. Um, they don't have to see this world as their enemy or as this terrible monster that's going to devour them. Um, no, um, not as something to be terribly afraid of. All they have to do is see the world as Jesus did, which was how? Uh, through the eyes of love. <laughs> For God so loved the world, right? And so Jesus, who loves the world, sends you and your children out as ambassadors of such love to this world. I mean, your lives, your homes, this church, all churches ought to be outposts of God's hospitality and grace. And I'll tell you what, that's the type of stuff that gets me excited. It really does. I mean, uh, Reformed theology food fights? No, that's not. That doesn't get me excited. A politics food fights? No. Um, arguments over critical race theory? No. It's, it's this kind of stuff, this like most important kind of stuff that we're on the precipice of this like awesome opportunity. This is what should get us excited. And so back to the book of Acts, you're saying, that was a long introduction to the sermon. Um, back to the book of Acts. What is going to be the first church in the Bible that looks out on the crazy, corrupt, evil, uh, wayward world of the Roman Empire, what will be the first church in the Bible that looks out on the world and says, we have exactly what they need? It is not the church in Jerusalem. It is the church we read about right now. It's the church of Antioch. Eleven nineteen. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who, on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was on them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. Uh, the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch, and when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them to all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined every one, according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it, sending it to the elders, by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Two-point sermon today, very simple. The first point is their city and our city, and the second point is their service and our service. Their city and our city, their service and our service. And the big theme of the sermon is really Acts, Acts 11 shows us what Jesus can accomplish in places like theirs, and therefore he can accomplish that in places like ours. Um, and the title of the sermon really says it all. It can happen here. It can happen here. How do I know? Well, their city, Antioch, uh, was this enormous cosmopolitan place. It was 15 times larger than the city of Jerusalem, the third largest city of the Roman Empire. Absolutely huge. 
And you can only imagine if you're an early Christian in a big city like this, maybe you've visited New York City and you kind of felt the same way, but when you're in a place that is that large, it makes you feel small. And it must have made their faith feel kind of tiny and provincial. Uh, Antioch was so large that the historians estimate that about 200 people resided per acre in the city in a time and a place where there you know, weren't high rises and in a time when there were no toilets. Can you imagine that? I mean, just people are crammed together, uh, 200 per acre in these tight little quarters. And surely the early Christians uh, in that city were wondering, you know, how can our, ti- our little faith have any impact on a place like this? The city was broken up into 18 different ethnic quarters. It was originally built by one of the generals of Alexander the Great, who named it after his father, Antiochus. And he built, as all ancient cities were built, with this you know, huge wall around the outside of the city to protect the people from um, invaders. But, it, but he also built large walls within the city, breaking it up into these 18 ethnic quarters Because they knew, um, kind of like we know today, that multi-ethnic cities, they can be a powder keg, right? If somebody, maybe somebody of one nationality or ethnicity steps on the toga of somebody else in the marketplace, somebody's offended. The next thing you know, you've got this like bloody riot on your hands. So the walls, these internal city walls were constructed as a way to keep the nationalities and the ethnicities from commingling. Verses 19 and 20, we see uh, this. When the early Christians fled from the city of Jerusalem because of the persecution that took place during the time of Stephen, these were all Jewish Christians, by the way, and and as they went out into the Roman Empire, they understandably ended up speaking to fellow Jews. They assumed that it would be the fellow Jews, religious people with whom we share common language, common culture, common worldview. Those are the kinds of people who would be most likely to receive the message of the gospel. But then a couple of these Christians, um, Jewish Christians from a couple of um, islands, they enter into the cosmopolitan city of Antioch, and for the very first time, they decide to preach the gospel to non-Jews, or as Luke calls them, Hellenists. By that, he simply means that these were people who spoke Greek and were steeped in the Greco-Roman worldview of their day. So they end up preaching the gospel, in a word, to the irreligious. I mean, it would have been speaking to men who had, like, all of their lives solicited temple prostitutes or had worshipped all these different gods, followed all of these corrupt practices. Um, And to the church's great surprise, the people who end up believing and, and being attracted to the gospel are not the religious folk, but it's these It really didn't matter what was your background. If you had political power and wealth and uh, maybe some literary accomplishments, or if you were nothing, nothing more than a run-of-the-mill, ordinary slave, the message was still for you. It didn't even matter that you were a previously really bad, wicked person. (laughs) The message of grace was still for you. It was available to anybody, no matter matter their background. This message, this, this beautiful, think about it, such beautiful message that there is no evil in this world that the Father's love cannot pardon and cover. Amen? And there is no, there is no wickedness in this world that is a match for the Father's grace. And that was was what was being preached to these guys in this enormous cosmopolitan city where you'd think the gospel would really struggle to gain traction into this eclectic mix of cultures and ethnicities and social statuses and and sheer lostness, where you'd think these are the least likely people to believe the message of the gospel. It is there, in that unlikely soil, the gospel takes root. Verse 22, Barnabas gets sent from the church in Jerusalem to check out like, what's going down, going down there. The rumors get back to the mother church, like there's something strange going on. So Barnabas comes into the city. He sees 
this is amazing. All these new baby Christians who uh, are believing, and um, I, I'm sure that they, they had to be really impressed with a guy like Barnabas, because Barnabas, it says he's a man full of the Holy Spirit. It says that he exhorted them to like, remain faithful to Jesus. He was a Levitical priest, uh, or a Levite rather, um, before he became a Christian. He had to be impressive. Like when Barnabas talked, they must have thought, this guy's good. <laughs> right? This guy is good. You're so amazing, Mr. Barnabas. You are the man. To which Barnabas replies, not really, <laughs> but I'm going to go get you the man. I'm going to go get you a better preacher than I am, a better teacher than I am. I'm going to go get you a man who has the ability to speak into your cultural world. Barnabas says, I'm not that guy, but I know who is, and who does he go and get? He goes and gets the Apostle Paul. What I've just described to you is basically the city of Chicago. Third largest city of the United States of America, give or take, right? Uh, it's not New York City. It's not Manhattan. It's not Rome of the, the city of Rome and the Roman Empire. But it's a big and diverse city. And seemingly, like Chicago, that's the photographic negative of the city of Meridian, Idaho, isn't it? And at first glance, you'd say, well, the city I just described, Antioch, and the place that I live, the two, they can't be more different until you dig a little deeper. What do I mean by that? I think that the suburbs are actually um, an unlikely place for the gospel of Jesus Christ to truly thrive. Um, which is a strange thing to say, I admit it, because it's not as though the suburbs are, are this, like, it's not as though they're openly hostile to the gospel, right? And it's not as though the suburbs are this you know, you know, big thing that makes you feel small and provincial. And it's not as though the suburbs are this bastion of multiculturalism where you're having to constantly you know, go across cultural boundaries. And yet, nevertheless, I mean, I've seen it in my lifetime. And like most guys who do church in the suburbs, they say the same thing, that it's hard to form healthy churches in this place. Have you heard the phrase before that we should be people who strive not to simply have church, but to be the church? Probably heard something like that before. Have church, by that they would just simply mean um, like have worship services on a Sunday. Like that's have church. Do that and little else more. And having church in the suburbs is something that is relatively easy to do. But to, to be the church, I mean, to be this, that's an expression, a much fuller expression of the fellowship and service and life of a community. That is relatively hard, okay, very hard to do in the suburbs. And I want to tell you why that is, in my opinion. So I was reading a, an article on the Gospel Coalition's website. It was written by a pastor in, he lives in the suburbs of Johannesburg in South Africa. And he's commenting both approvingly and negatively about his experience in the suburbs, thinking through questions of like, why do people live here? Uh, what are the shared values that we have in the suburbs? And what he writes about South Africa and Johannesburg is eerily similar to Idaho. I think you'll agree. First off, he claims that there are three primary values of suburbia. Convenience, abundance, and comfort. Sounds about right to me. Convenience, abundance, and comfort. He goes on. The suburbs are a wonderful place. I really like living there. The schools are good. The parks are nice and plentiful. The areas are safe. Everything is new. You know, families love to move to the suburbs. Retirees, they like to move to the suburbs. I mean, everything's new. The grocery stores are new. The doctors, your doctors are close by. The poor, they're not close by. You don't have to see them. You know, maybe there's an occasional panhandler standing on the corner, but, but just the ugliness of the world, the, the graffiti or the trash or people living on the streets, you know, use syringes, um, injustice. And those are, <laughs> they're not really found. Not in the nice new suburbs. Suburbs are... They are clearly islands of homogeneity. I mean, our houses look alike. 
Our, our beautifully manicured lawns look, they all look alike or else your neighborhood association is going to send you a nasty letter, right? Um, people people kind of look alike. People are similar. And this is profound. He says, in many ways, the suburbs are an attempt to create a bit of the kingdom of heaven on earth. It's an alternative kingdom. It's a kingdom of peace and security and uh, cleanliness, convenience, and it can all be situated within a five-mile radius of your home, which is centered on yourself or on your kids, which are yourself. (laughs) By and large, self is big in the suburbs. The suburbs, if you think about it, the suburbs are almost like this series of transactional experiences, you know, commercialized transactions where you can get what you want for yourself at an extremely convenient price to yourself. Um, and it's glorious. It is. I mean, think of how many of your desires can be met with such relative ease. Your restaurant needs, they're right there. Your shopping needs and your entertainment needs, they can all be found at Costco or the village. I mean, could there, could there really be a more efficient convenient or abundant way to live so easily. But of course, when you live in a place that is built around your comfort and convenience, sacrificing those things for something else, something greater, does not come easy to you. You know, some of the drawbacks of the suburbs include the cost of living there and the busyness of living there, right? It's expensive to live in the suburbs, um, increasingly so here in the Treasure Valley. And if you move into a nicer house, your mortgage payment, like right now, I can't imagine how hard that would be. Your mortgage payment goes up, it's expensive, and so you gotta work longer hours. You have to work more. And you have to, uh, yeah, the finances get tighter. It's also super busy because suburbs are centered on schedules for kids. Now, life can seem like an endless routine of school runs and latte shops, long commutes to work punctuated, by long days at work, and a whole lot of stressful work, followed by soccer matches and gymnastics tournaments, which turn into these short weekends that are exhausting and totally fun, and then get back on the hamster wheel and do it all over again. And we might add here in Idaho, I mean, we have all the bliss of the mountains in our backyard, right? Skiing at Brundage, and the cabin in the woods, and boating on Lake McCall. If you really think of it, life Life in Meridian, it is almost a little bit of heaven on earth. A certain kind of heaven. Now, I hope you understand, I am a, I am a suburbanite kid. I have literally lived nowhere else all of my life, except for three years in seminary. I've been in the suburbs all my life. I love the suburbs. I'm not bashing on the suburbs. Um, but I'm also keenly aware, as a suburbanite, how difficult it is to build communities of closeness and, 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 and cultures of, of service and sacrifice. It's very hard to do with busy suburban families and retirees. And so the last thing I want to say from um, the, our brother in South Africa, he said, here's what you ought to do. You got to call your people, call them to, call them to sacrifice to serve, to resist, to be foreigners and aliens in that place. And there is, there is nothing more foreign and alien than for a suburbanite to come into a church and not be asking the question, what's in it for me? If you think about it, nearly every space that we walk into in suburbia, we are asking that question, right? Because it's all just a series of transactional actions. We, we do that at the restaurant. We do that at the store. What's in it for me at a price that is acceptable to me? But no, we've, we have to be asking if we are living by the mission of Jesus, how much of my comfort and convenience and weekend skiing and club soccer schedules can I sacrifice for the sake of Antioch, of my Antioch? People are the mission. I, if you get nothing more out of this sermon, just remember that line. What is the mission of Jesus Christ on earth? Yeah, people. People are the mission. 
And the reason that you and I are here, right here, right here, right now, is because Jesus Christ made us his mission. And when you think about that deeply, when you really think about that, it will melt your heart. I, I fully believe the, the way we get suburban people to live the kind of life I was just calling you to, it is not, and I hope you don't hear it this way, it is not to scold you into like shame-based compliance. No, it's just, it is to melt our hearts with the message of God's grace to people like us. I heard somebody say this, and he was like, oh, bingo. He said he believed that one of the major reasons why Christians, why we don't experience more, like more transformation, spiritual transformation inside of us, is because we are so busy scolding our hearts for our non-compliance, rather than melting our hearts with the message of the gospel. When I heard that, I was like, bingo, that's me. Because I'm, you, I mean, you can even hear it in a lot of my sermons. I beat the tar out of myself, out of, out of my own heart. But you'll never, you'll never really become this unless it's, it's motivated by God's grace and love. So preach that message to your heart. I got to hurry on to point number two. So their city and our city, at first glance, they look totally different. But, but both are unlikely places for the gospel to take root. Secondly, their service and our service. Let's go back to the text for a minute. <clears throat> Antioch, as I said, was built with a bunch of walls inside the city to separate the 18 different ethnic quarters. But once the gospel was preached to the various you know, people in that city, like their experience of Jesus was so profound that it caused them to start going through those walls, right? It brought all these people together across cultures, people who by all accounts should not be friends, should not be worshiping together, should not be serving one another. They start, you know, coming together, intersecting, like hard intersecting life. And if you look at verse 25, it says that it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. And we speed through that when we read, do you realize how remarkable that is? What it is saying, what Luke is telling us, is they had to come up with a new word in their dictionary to describe this, to describe these people, to describe this community. We have never seen anything like this in our city. Um, we can't call it Jew religion, and we can't call it Greek religion. We, we have to call it by the title of the guy they keep always talking about, <laughs> Christ. You know, the tie that bound them together was Christ, which on a more profound level meant the tie that enabled them to do the very hard work of people living in quadrant number five, sharing life with quadrant number two, <laughs> Um, think about just all of the cultural faux pas that would, were potential, right? And all of the misunderstandings and, and all of the different togas that could be stepped on. You know, how it had to be very hard work for them to do all of that. And yet it, the tie, what made it all possible was this guy by the name of Jesus. He, Jesus is the one who motivated all those hard conversations, all that patient forbearance with one another, um, keeping short accounts and not, you know, tallying mark all of the different offenses I've suffered, um, all of the forgiving each other. All of that was baked into the community that God was creating in the city of Antioch. And you know what ends up happening? In a word, they out community the world. They had a better community. That bet the community that was formed there was better than anything else you could find in the city of Antioch and frankly, anywhere else you could find in the Roman Empire. Like they invited people to come in and see this community and what they found once they were on the inside was this is better than anything else you can find in the world. Amen? And that's the greatest challenge for the church in suburbia is to out-community the world. 
I mean, you think about it, the only group that seems to do it fairly well are the Mormons. And the primary reason they are able to do it is because they are loaded with money and they have this culture that says, if you don't do this, 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 you're not going to heaven. I mean, it's this, it is all motivated by legalism <laughs> and the legalism funds, funds the money, but they definitely out community the world. If you look at verse, or rather chapter 13, verses one through three, uh, Luke ends up providing a list of the church leaders in the, in the city of Antioch. And these turn out to be five of the most different guys you could ever put in the same room. The first is listed, I think it's Barnabas, who I already mentioned, was a Levitical, uh, a Levite from the city, or from the island rather, of Cyprus. Paul, a former Pharisee, an absolute Torah genius, who grew up in the city of Tarsus, which Tarsus would have been almost like the Oxford of their day. I mean, the seat of intellectual learning. And, you know, Paul is, he's a genius. He's, an, he's a genius. He, he knows the, the Greek worldview inside and out. He knows the Torah inside out. The third guy who's listed there is Lucius of Cyrene. So Cyrene would have been Northern Africa. And Lucius, uh, the Northern Africans, they're more like what we th would think of as uh, Arabic. So you got an Arabic guy. And then the fourth is Manan, whom we don't know a lot about him, but he, it says that he, he grew up in the household of King Herod uh, Antipas. So it means that he was coming from uh, the upper crust of society. And then fifthly and finally, Simon called Niger, Niger is the word black, and so most likely Simon was a, a black African. And, and what I just described to you is a simple, um, wonderful truth, that the early Christians were way ahead of their times. When we talk about, you know, multicultural leadership teams, you can't get more multicultural than that. They were, they were way before their times. And obviously, the citizens of Antioch, when, when they saw that, it, it just made them say, maybe there's something, something different going on here, something wonderful. And then when they were invited into the community and they experienced the grace and the warmth and, and the care that was shared across these barriers, yeah, we don't know what to call them. I guess we'll just call them um, the name of the guy they're always talking about. What, it, what stands out to me the most is simply this. There were walls inside the city, right? There were no walls inside the church. All of those walls that characterized their city, um, the tribalization, the, the angry group versus another angry group. I mean, isn't like 21st century America? Those walls were not found in that church. I could preach an entire sermon on um, the other healthy church practices that are listed in the city of Antioch. Verse 26, they would disciple new Christians for an entire year. Verse 29, they were radically sacrificial in their mercy ministry giving as they send all this money to people they had never met before back in the city of Jerusalem for, because the, the famine had been prophesied. Or chapter 13, of those five guys, they send out two of their five, like 40% of their core leadership team, they send out to um, go do church planting and, and missionary work. Um, it's really a model church in so many respects. But when I bring it back here to All Saints, here and now, or hopefully post-COVID All Saints, as I think about what would it mean for our church to serve across, you know, groups, especially as we consider the summer and the fall. Um, I have a lot of ideas on that topic, and I don't have the time to go through all of them. I'll just give you one, and I'm, let me preface this Here's the disclaimer. I'm not saying we're necessarily going to do this. I, I just want us just think about it, all right? What if we no longer had to staff our nursery with moms, with mother volunteers? Um, what if the older generation in our church that lives in, you know, quarter number five of Antioch, uh, what if they helped this other group in our church? I'm Okay, I thought of it in this way. If you have a, a person who has been a Christian for 50 years of their life, 
And they have listened to, on average, 52 sermons a year. And maybe we say like 52, that's a little high. 52 Bible studies and sermons in the course of a year. Do you know what that means? They have listened to 2,600 sermons in their lifetime. It's unlikely that you're going to hear anything different or new from me that you haven't heard about 20 other times before. Take a 26-year-old mother who walks into our church this morning, and I hope that there is nobody who, I wrote this up, I hope, like, if we have a visitor today that's age 26 and has a three-year-old child and a seven-year-old child, I promise I had no knowledge of you, <laughs> you showing up. But, so she and her husband come, three-year-old, six-year-old, how many sermons in their lifetime do you think a 26-year-old mom has heard? Especially if she's either a new Christian or maybe, God willing, she's here and she's not even a Christian at all. And you know what we'd ask that mom to do <laughs> when she comes? Can you serve in the nursery? Yeah, can you? And I don't know how frequent it is, Rhoda, but we ask them to serve a certain number of Sundays over the course of a few months. All because we have forever, as long as I've been here, been chronically understaffed in the nursery. Um, and of course, COVID has just made it so much worse. Um, but think back to her and her husband. So they have a three-year-old in the nursery, and they have a, six, a seven-year-old sitting next to him. If it is a seven-year-old like most seven-year-olds in America, that kid has never sat still for more than 15 minutes without a television screen in front of his face, right? That's, that's it. And we, they come in, and we expect that seven-year-old to sit through a going on 38-minute sermon right now in an 80-some-minute worship service. What is that mom feeling? What is that dad feeling? They're like, my kid is just, they're going to create us disturbance. And the kid is just, you know, dancing and running around. And so that 26-year-old mom and dad, who probably haven't heard hardly any sermons, um, they're not listening to this one right now because they're, they're so worried about creating a disturbance on Sunday morning. I mean, moms, am I describing something that you have felt and experienced before? What if we had like 10 permanent, 12 permanent Christian couples or individuals who are older in the faith uh, to work with Tessa in the nursery? Um, people whose kids are out of the home, who've listened to literally thousands of sermons in their lifetime, who maybe need to learn some new skills about how to care for kids again. But, but what if they sacrificed their comfort and their convenience and abundance uh, to make sure that one out of 10 or 12 Sundays, we never have a mom have to work in the nursery again? And I think, I, look, I know that there, there are plenty of you who've already done that. And for that, I am truly, truly grateful. Um, but when the older Christians living in Antioch quarter number five start helping the others living in quarter number 18, you know, that is just a baby step along the road to becoming what? A better community. Um, and I'm, by the same token, there's absolutely no reason somebody in our church age 60 or 65 and above, like, should ever have to shovel their driveways after a big snowstorm if they don't want to, right? I mean, we have plenty, we should, we, I thought about this in the last big one we had a few weeks ago, like, why don't we just own, as a church, two snowblowers and just go around and, you know, blow out their driveway and their neighbor's driveway and their neighbor's neighbor's driveway. We could blow out whole neighborhoods. In fact, we probably should be, especially when we move into a new location. Well, the other thing I thought about was that when we do move into a new location, by God's grace, those 26-year-old moms, they're going to be coming here. They'll, they'll, be able, they'll be coming here with much more regularity. And so it is just so, so important that, okay, for a church in the suburbs to out-community the world, it is going to take a lot of effort in the leadership of our church, we have got to do so much better a job of organizing functional ministry teams that, that involves all of the church to, to do that work together. Um, 
And I believe that, I hope that that's actually, you know, the, the precipice we're standing on right now. And the Lord is going to take us forward in that way. Let me conclude with this. Um, you know, All Saints is a church that really cares about church planting. We planted a church in downtown Boise in 2019 at, at a great sacrifice uh, of our own. And we are members of the Northwest Church Planning Network. We're a board church there. I'm on the board. This is a network that plants um, like-minded churches in Alaska, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. The network this past week sent me information. They, they, had, uh, they had sent out an impact survey, survey to eight existing church plants. And these are churches, new churches that have been planted within the last, let's say, I don't know, uh, 10 years, probably more recent than that. But planted in cities like Seattle and Portland, kind of Antioch cities where you'd think, oh man, the gospel is going to have a hard time taking root there. They sent this out and received anonymous responses from the members of the congregations. Here's what they said. There were 256 de-churched people, that is people who had left the church, capital C, who had come back into the church in one of these eight new church plants. 200 and almost 260. That's great news. 318 responded and said that in their churches they had been experiencing deep gospel renewal in their lives, transformative like spiritual renewal in their lives. 318. There was $600,000 in benevolence and missions giving among these eight new churches. And the number that encouraged me so much and kind of blew me away, any idea how many new conversions, new people who came to the faith, in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it happened in eight churches. Any idea? 109 new conversions. And I promise you, the network is not patting themselves on the back saying, well done, boys. Oh, we or organized this really well. We did it. We did a great job. What they are saying is verse 21. The hand of the Lord was upon us. The hand of which Lord? What's the Lord that is being spoken about in this passage? It's Jesus, isn't it? The hand of the Lord Jesus was upon us. When the Christians at Antioch started speaking the gospel to new people, the irreligious kind, the prodigal sons and unlikely younger brothers, the people you would think that would say, no, thank you. No, nah, that's not for me. The hand of the Lord Jesus was upon them and many were added to the faith. And that's always the key. It is. Anytime, anything good happens in our faith, amen? It's all because Jesus has been at work. And I just hope that by sharing those results with you, uh, it would encourage you to just hear what Jesus is accomplishing in our regions. Because if it can happen in Antioch, and it can happen in Seattle, and it can happen in Portland, it can happen here. Uh, and frankly, you have more of an opportunity than even they were given. It can happen here. It can happen anywhere. Because Jesus has, he has shoes for the barefoot. And because Jesus has said, people are the mission. And because you friends, you all saints, you have exactly what the world needs right now. Amen. Well, would you please stand? Friends, the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Ah, Father, you formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. And when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. Your spirit came upon prophets and teachers, anointing them to speak your word. And your spirit came upon the Lord Jesus, 
enabling him to fulfill all righteousness in his sinless life, death, and resurrection. And even today, your spirit graciously comes upon us to correct and to discipline, uh, to encourage, to call, so that we might become mature and complete sons and daughters. Thanks be to God for your indescribable gift, and, and thank you, Lord, that we get to come to the table now. Ah, that we pray your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord Jesus, would come and take bread and wine and make this a true, a wonderful, overflowing banquet for our souls. Indeed, we ask this in the name of your Son. Amen.
The Eucharist is the family meal of Christians. And the words that we say every week before the table, they're either taken from Jesus' words in the upper room, the Last Supper, or here from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I will now take up our tithes and offerings. Again, it's really wonderful to worship with you. Every Sunday we have a prayer for the church and the world, but uh, today we're actually going to be praying for our church, for all saints. So would you please pray with me? Father, we thank you that when our words are insufficient, we remember that they are made perfect because of our advocate who is by your side, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that it is the Holy Spirit who helps us in our weaknesses to make our prayers uh, come to you. We pray for all saints, and we thank you for her. We remember that we have members of our congregation who are in need of physical healing. We pray for John Falk, for Rob Shaner, and there are others even in this room, who are struggling emotionally and mentally, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would fall on them. 
From what we've heard this morning, we pray that you would give us a vision for those of us who know the gospel so well and continue to feed on it, and yet it doesn't affect us in terms of loving our neighbor and changing this world. We pray that your Holy Spirit again would fall on us and help us to know that being a Christian isn't just understanding how a Greek phrase is used, but it is to be overflowing with joy that we have been forgiven, that we have a gospel, the good news that transcends politics and race and economic standings. We pray that in this confused culture that we live in, that we would remember that the gospel is something that is moving forward and is not being defended as a fortress. We pray that we would remember the best way for a lion to defend itself is to let it go. And we remember that in your mercy you have given us some property and we want to uh, put a gospel church there that out communities any community that anybody can imagine. You've done this before, Father. You've asked us to pray that it would be done again, and so we do through the name of our, our brother, our champion, our hero, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Please greet those around you. I know a lot of faces are back today. Uh, we can't go to all the world, to the far nations of the world, if we can't walk across a room, right, and, and greet someone. So please do that. And if you're here and I didn't get to talk to you um, this morning and you're back, um, come grab me here at the front. I'd love to, love to chat. Friends, let us go forth and serve the world as those who have been loved by our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.